now, my pestilent friends, the moment you have been waiting for, the climax of the evening, the presentation of the Fourth Horseman Award to the communicable disease of the year. As you know, the Microbe Academy makes this award each year to the disease who has done the most effective job of contaminating others causing epidemics, spreading virulence, and infecting mankind in general. Uh, may I have the envelope, please? This year, for the first time in centuries, the coveted Fourth Horseman Award goes to venereal disease. And let's have a big hand, folks. I am deeply moved by this singular tribute to my life's work. It is a great honor. In accepting this award in the name of all my fellow venereal diseases, I wish to thank everyone out there in the world, those marvelous human beings without whose cooperation this award would not have been possible. It's a fit. He oh, doesn't yeah, deserve yeah. it. Come on, no. What are you terrible. talking about? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> What about me? I, I'm still the number one communicable... Communicable... <laughs> true, true, but you must admit you're not particularly lethal. Uh, you're more of a nuisance than anything else. I mean, uh, you're not really big league. Well, what about me? Speaking of big leagues, I've scarred and disfigured millions of people. Oh, you've been under control for years. You see, in making our decision, we have carefully considered all your attributes, uh, you diphtheria and tuberculosis, scarlet fever, you were all great in your day, but all of you put together are no match for venereal disease. Let me put his work in proper perspective. This is my good friend, Count Spirochete, better known to all of you as syphilis. Oh, there are many forms of venereal disease, but he is the aristocrat. Hold it, hold it. I'm a venereal disease, too. And I attack 20 times more people than the Count. Ah, my old friend, Gonorrhea. Crude little fellow. Quite effective, though. Uh, you're right. You do infect 20 times more people than syphilis. But I, Count Spirochete, kill. Kill! Kill! No. True, Count. In fact, in the United States, far more people have died from syphilis than from all other communicable diseases put together. But let's not argue among old friends. You are both very effective in your own ways. Over 100,000 people in the United States alone contract syphilis each year, and two million are attacked by gonorrhea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought that <laughs> after World War II, with the advent of penicillin, that venereal disease <laughs> was practically eradicated. So everyone thought. But venereal disease, like all of mankind's plagues, has its ups and downs. It comes and goes, just like the whims of man himself. Of course, we know that syphilis and his venereal companions have existed since the origin of mankind. But until the end of the 15th century, there is little evidence to show that he exerted much influence in the civilized world. In fact, until the middle of the Renaissance, my friend the Count lay quite dormant. After all of these years, an army on the move. Ah, they are playing my song. <laughs> Historians are uncertain where it was first introduced on a large scale, but there is no doubt as to when nor to how the disease spread. 
In the 1490s, the first great syphilis epidemic broke out in Europe, following in the footsteps of the mercenary armies of the time. The soldiers and their camp followers carried the disease wherever they traveled. Within a few short years, syphilis had established a firm foothold on the civilized world. The Renaissance heralded an age of exploration. If ever there was a time just right for the spread of venereal disease, it was then. It was a time of scientific curiosity, of intellectual conquest, as well as other types of conquests. For three and a half centuries, little was known about the disease, except that it left in its wake millions of people who were scarred, crippled, driven mad, and eventually killed. It was not until the 1800s that medical science discovered that there were actually two principal diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea. Gonococcus, the coffee bean-shaped germ causing gonorrhea was identified first. And then, in 1905, using a special laboratory technique, a doctor unmasked the spirochete, the corkscrew-shaped microbe that causes syphilis. At last, after centuries of human misery, doctors were able to discover the true nature of venereal disease. Unlike common germs that travel in food or through the air on particles of dust or on the bodies of insects, venereal disease microbes generally cannot stay alive outside of the body. The spirochete and the gonococcus to survive must live inside the body. They can travel only when carried by the normal body fluid. For the germs to spread from one person to another, there must be an unbroken, moist, intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. <laughs> Syphilis and gonorrhea attack the body differently Let's look at gonorrhea first. To get inside the body, he has to go through the tender mucous membrane that lines all the body exits. In the man, his most common entry point is the tube inside the penis, called the urethra. The gonococcus begins attacking the membrane immediately. Within three to eight days, enough of the membrane has been perforated that urination causes a fierce burning sensation. As the body fights back, another clear-cut symptom can be easily seen, the formation of pus. A thick fluid will drift from the penis. The pus, which contains millions of gonococcus germs, is the vehicle that transmits the disease. So, as soon as the pus appears, the man knows he is infectious. That is, he is capable of passing the disease on to someone else. In the woman, the gonococcus usually establishes a foothold in the body by attacking the mucous membrane at the entrance to the uterus. Unlike the painful symptoms in the man, the damage in the woman will probably not result in any pain at all. And even though the infection produces pus, it is not as easy to notice in the woman as it is in the man. Yet, the woman is just as infectious as the man. Even though there are no obvious symptoms, and even though she may be unaware she has contracted the disease. She may never suspect anything is wrong until the disease has caused a lot of damage. For example, during childbirth, the baby travels in close contact with the infected passage. If the gonococcus gets into the baby's eyes, it causes blindness. 
This is why most states have laws requiring special medication in the eyes of all newborn babies. If untreated, gonorrhea works its way further into the reproductive system. It can strangle the tube that carries the egg to the uterus. For all practical purposes, the woman is sterile. In the same manner, gonorrhea can strangle the tube carrying the sperm from its point of manufacture, thus sterilizing the man as well. Without proper medical treatment, there is a good chance that the gonococcus will eventually get into the bloodstream and spread throughout the body. While gonorrhea rarely causes death, it can produce painful joints, swelling, and ultimately, severe crippling. Syphilis, on the other hand, behaves differently. It is more insidious. The symptoms are more difficult to detect. In the man, the spirochete usually enters through the outer skin on the penis. The first sign that anything is wrong may be a small, painless sore, which usually shows up at the exact place where the germ entered the body. This is called a chancre. The chancre, or any other sore caused by syphilis, is the means by which the disease is transmitted. It serves as a staging area where the initial invaders pause to multiply. In women, the spirochete usually enters through the wall of the vagina. The danger here is that the chancre may go unnoticed because it is hidden deep inside the body. The spirochete's entry is not limited to the genital area. It can enter any part of the skin surface where there is a small cut or abrasion, providing that the abraded or broken skin comes in contact with the chancre or lesion of an infectious person. In time, the chancre will disappear. This will happen whether proper medical treatment was applied or the victim did nothing at all. This leads many people to falsely assume the disease went away. The spirochetes having multiplied start boring through the walls of the blood vessels and the lymphatic system distributing themselves throughout the body. This is the secondary stage of syphilis. And without proper medical examination, it is difficult to detect. The main reason for this is the spirochete's unique theatrical ability, often referred to as the great imitator. Syphilis masquerades as a variety of different illnesses. The infected person may break out in a rash, resembling anything from hives to measles. He may suffer from sore throat, become feverish, lose patches of hair, and break out in ugly raw sores, particularly in moist areas of the body. Like the shankers, these rashes and sores are loaded with spirochetes, and any other person whose skin rubs against them may become infected with syphilis. The infectious period for syphilis ranges from the time the first chancre appeared all the way through the duration of the secondary symptoms. This may last as long as two years. Even after the infectious period is over, a woman can pass on syphilis to her unborn baby through the umbilical cord. Chances are that if this occurs, the baby will be born dead. If not dead, then at least it will be born with congenital syphilis, which will manifest itself in a number of cruel and crippling ways. If after the infectious period, syphilis is not treated, serious damage to the body will begin to occur. Blindness, crippling, insanity, and death. If these guys are so great, 
How do they stack up against the body's natural immunity? Still not convinced, eh? Well, let me go on. As you know, every human being manufactures certain chemicals called antibodies. They are designed to fight off invading germs. This is the body's natural immunity. But gonorrhea is a very tough customer. Charge! Even if enough antibodies are manufactured to subdue an invasion of gonorrhea, quite a bit of damage may have already taken place. But it is possible, in some cases, for the body to eventually overcome gonorrhea. But syphilis is a far more formidable adversary and can seldom be overcome by the body's natural immunity. threat to venereal disease is the person who has the common sense and courage to share his suspicions with a doctor. Only a professional diagnosis can confirm or rule out the presence of a venereal disease. And if the tests are positive, there is only one cure, the timely application of the right antibiotic. against the antibiotic. They've discovered my weakness. I'll, I'll be eradicated. For centuries, I've been invincible. What can I do? You have nothing to fear, my friend. You have lost only one battle. The war is not over yet. You have a very strong ally. Ally? Call it stigma. There is a powerful stigma attached to venereal disease. And this means that young people are afraid to confide their suspicions in their parents or even in their family doctor. Because factual information is seldom discussed, misinformation abounds. More and more people are taking chances. More and more people from all walks of life. And there is no possible way in which a promiscuous person can tell whether his or her companion is infectious or not. And one infectious person can start a chain reaction that rapidly spreads throughout an entire community, cuts across social and economic boundaries, and even spans the country. And so, my little friends, this is why tonight we honor the Count. All of you have had your moment in the sun, so to speak, and now the Count has earned his. We're sorry we misjudged you. Uh, you're a good and faithful friend. We wish you would uh, <coughs> forgive us. We respect you to the... to the... <coughs> to the end. I think it is a very happy end. The ending gets happier and happier. I'm beginning to think that maybe I don't like this ending after all. 